I'm Michael Cahill. I am the Dean here at Brooklyn Law School, and it is a delight to welcome you all to this event on, as it says before me, Advancing AI in Medicine, the Role of Law and Policy in Accelerating Medical Research. Uh, I'm very interested in this topic as a former health law professor myself, um, but also uh, more broadly as someone who is a big believer in the increasing impact of big data and data-driven decision-making on all professions, uh, including our own as lawyers. We are here to talk about another one, but there are uh, a lot of pervasive issues involving data-driven decision-making uh, that are relevant to our profession, as well as the medical profession. And we have three uh, distinguished and capable people here to talk to us about those issues in the medical field uh, tonight. Uh, first, of course, we are fortunate to have with us our own visiting professor, Frank Pasquale, uh, reading his title, the Piper and Marbury Professor of Law at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Uh, but he is ours for the fall semester, and we are delighted to have him. Uh, he is, of course, eminently qualified to talk on this topic as uh, uh, he almost literally wrote the book on this topic, The Black Box Society, about uh, algorithms, machine learning, um, database decision making, uh, and offering uh, reforms to improve the information economy. We're also very fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Anthony uh, Costa and Dr. Eric Orman from Mount Sinai Health System uh, and the Icon School of Medicine at uh, Sinai. Uh, Dr. Costa, uh, on the far right, is COO of the Mount Sinai AI Consortium and Director of Sinai Biodesign. Dr. Orman is Director of AI Sinai, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, the Artificial Intelligence Research Group over at Mount Sinai. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here to be able to offer events of this kind. Let me take one moment to thank Liz Alper, our events coordinator at the back of the room, Karen Porter, director of our Center for uh, Health Science and Public Policy at the front of the room. Everything that is happening tonight is attributable to one or the other of them. So please join me in thanking them for making it possible. And with that, enjoy the program. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Cahill. It's just terrific to be uh, part of this event. And I have to start just by thanking uh, Professor Porter for just your visionary leadership in terms of bringing us together. Uh, we were thinking about events brainstorming, and I, I said, oh, I can do one myself. And then but we, uh, Professor Porter really challenged me to do more and to bring in members of the community. And I think that's going to really do a lot to uh, enrich the conversation tonight. So just to give you sort of the running order tonight, I'm going to give you some views on solving three dilemmas in AI and health law and policy. I'm then going to introduce uh, Drs. Orman and Costa for their presentation. Then we'll have a bit of a conversation, some questions, and then we can enjoy the reception a bit afterwards and just talk in a more informal setting. So to start with advancing AI in medicine, the role of law and policy, I'm going to try to solve three dilemmas tonight, or at least propose some solutions, um, somewhat provocatively, um, that will try to deal with three issues. And the largest problem that I think we should be considering today is that you know, we have in the U.S., we're spending more of our GDP on healthcare, but we have worse results than lots of richer nations that have about our GDP or lower than our GDP, right? And it's pretty remarkable. You look at these, this sort of average of uh, 10 OECD nations with the largest per capita GDP, and they have a life expectancy of 82 years, and they're spending about 11% of GDP on healthcare. The U.S., 78.6 um, years and 17%. That's quite a disconnect, right? And part of what I'm going to be discussing is that cost dilemma and how to address it and, you know, whether we should reconsider it. Secondly, I'll be looking at, just going in reverse order of the slide, the professional pipeline. If we do more and more with AI, if we sort of are going for robots that can replace professionals, how do we keep professionals in the pipeline to train those robots, right? That's a difficult question. And then also the data dilemma. And that's actually what I'll start with, which is there are lots of uses of data that can be positive. But for every positive use, there can be a negative use. And how do we try to deal with that problem? So let's start with the data dilemma. And I'll just pose it at first with an example from Australia, which was called My Health Record. In Australia, there was a promise to individuals that they could put together all of their records into this mega health record. They could bring together their aged care records, stuff from their pharmacists, their primary care physicians, specialists, et cetera. But there was enormous worry about it because people thought, 
wow, that's a lot of information to have available to almost any health practitioner in Australia. And there was not a lot of thought put in before this was put forward about how to condition access on those with a need-to-know basis, right? And so that led to a lot of opt-outs. I think at least a million people opted out, which sort of damaged the system. At least it certainly damaged legitimacy of the system. It may well, may well damage um, its validity in terms of scientific matters. And thinking further about why that happened, we have to think further about if we need to assess the risks in these scenarios, what are the security levels that our health data will have, right? How secure will it be? Also, is this the only source of information that people will use to figure out our health status? Or could they use other things? Could they use how we shop, our gym records, our use of the internet online, how we walk? Can they infer our data from those things? If so, that may lower the stakes of health data, but raise the stakes of data overall. And finally, what can be done with the data? And I'm going to give you some examples now. Here's one that I think is just a remarkable finding. It is the telltale mouse switch. Okay. And this is that if you're using your mouse on your computer and you are sort of not just mousing around, looking at different websites, clicking, researchers have studied that data and the speed of the mouse movements, and they found that certain, certain twitches in people's hands can be predictive of Parkinson's disease. And the data they used essentially was to look back from six months, uh, they had people who searched for Parkinson's, then they looked backward as to what their mouse movements were like six months before, and using machine learning, you could detect certain patterns. Okay. Um, by the way, if you've ever used those little quizzes on Facebook that say, how old are you, try to connect the dots, or sort of follow the dot, et cetera, they're pretty accurate, they're remarkably accurate, but they're doing exactly the same thing, right? They're doing that sort of thing about this large-scale pattern recognition. And I think what's remarkable about this is this type of data could be incredible if, for example, it could predict heart attacks. Imagine something that you're wearing a Fitbit and it predicts heart attacks within like five hours and then you know that you may want to take a certain drug or be near a hospital. But it's terrifying if you think about it possibly being fed to your employer, right? And especially in the U.S. with self-insured healthcare plans, they can save some money if they got rid of people who are sicker or likely to be sick, um, which is very troubling and against the law. But part of the problem here is how do you find out how people are using data? It's often very difficult to find that out, even if it is against the law. Secondly, um, you know, it could be used in life insurance, right? Life insurance is sort of one of those areas that's just a uh, real wild west with respect to use of data. Um, and it could be used in many other areas. So how do we separate? This is the data dilemma. How do we make sure that the good uses of data can be put forward while the bad uses of data, the troubling uses of data are stopped, right? Another example could be a voice or face parser, right? This is already being used, if you might have seen, the company called HireVue. There are people in colleges who are being coached for exactly what type of facial expressions and mode of voice type of terms to use in order to convince the HireVue algorithm that they would be a good employee, okay? This is very troubling as well in that sort of hiring context. In healthcare, there are some very interesting applications that could be developed with respect to diagnostics, for example, in mental, mental illness. So you could imagine this type of technology being integrated into primary care physicians' encounters with their patients. Right now, a lot of depression screens are quite crude. They're, they also might be time, uh, take time to administer. Something like this could eventually be a much faster way of detecting depression and maybe getting people referred to the help that they need. But on the other hand, should this sort of a technology be part of the normal medical regimen? And I think there are some very difficult questions we have to answer about that. Uh, another example of this, just to give an example of uh, facial recognition technology as used in life insurance um, or other uh, areas of insurance, a company called Lapidus says that it can look at people's faces and detect their, chrono their biological as opposed to their chronological age. And one of the examples they give is just, if you go to your high school reunion, you notice that some people seem to age faster than others. Okay? <laughs> and and this is an effort to sort of infer from faces whether someone is smoking, their BMI, um, rough living, whatever that might be, all these sorts of things. And, and this is a sort of a, a new emerging application of some of this big data technology that right now, again, is very lightly regulated, if at all. Um, but by contrast, we can imagine a world where we could pick up telltale signs of disease from the face. And in fact, there's a story online about a, someone who is on a uh, talk show, daytime talk show, and they had a mole on their neck. There was a doctor watching who had an HDTV, blew it up and said, wow, you might have melanoma. And it was true, they did. Okay. And so this is kind of remarkable, right? Again, we have all of these amazing capacities to help people, but then these really troubling capacities to harm them or to classify them in ways that will harm them, right? 
So here's an idea that here's so you know putting this all together. The data dilemma really is a question of dual use. And this is something we've dealt with in technology for a long time, dual use technologies, right? I mean, you can use uh, certain technologies. Guns, for example, can be used in very good ways and very bad ways, right? In very legitimate ways and illegitimate ways. Same, for example, with copying technology online, these sorts of things. You know, you've got dual use technologies all over the place. And we have to think, I think, very clearly about the promises, which are exemplified in this Eric Topol book, Deep Medicine, where he really takes on what is the future of AI and machine learning and medicine, and something like Lewis Maltby's Can They Do That, which was about employers' use of data to classify or to stigmatize or to otherwise subordinate employees. Both of those are in the offing here. The data from our Fitbits, from just our use of the, tech, use of, uh, uh, tech, uh, the computer, et cetera. I also just wanted to note as well that you, know, you might say, well, okay, you're scaring us with some of this data use stuff, but we do have HIPAA about health data. True, HIPAA is a very robust set of protections with respect to health data. However, there are new interoperability rules that enhance the downloadability of health information. Lots of people now are going to be able to download huge amounts of health data onto their phone, onto the cloud, etc. Once you've downloaded that data, say goodbye to the HIPAA protection, right? Because HIPAA applies to covered entities, not to the health data itself. And this is something I've been talking to people in the Senate, in the House, in HHS. I tell them as much as I can, please make the people that download data, make them business associates of their doctors, so therefore HIPAA protections will run with that data further than they would ordinarily. And so far, and I've, I've, even, I've talked to presidential campaign staffs, et cetera, I'm trying to get the word out, but that is probably not going to happen anytime soon. So this is a real worry, right? It's a real worry that we could like lose control of that data. And so how do we solve these dilemmas? Well, my idea is that essentially the current paradigm is that you need to inform yourself and make a decision balancing self-interest and social goals. That's how you decide whether to join something like My Health Record, whether to buy a Fitbit, whether to do certain things online. I think that's rapidly becoming outdated because no one can assess the risks. No one has any idea what the situation will be five or 10 years from now. My view is that ultimately what we need to focus on is a society where we license uses of big data and AI. And we license positive uses and we don't license negative uses. I essentially call for flipping the presumption. Right now the presumption is you have data, you can use it any way you wish, and people have got to think about ways post hoc to make illegal the worst uses of data. I think given the power of this type of data, it needs to actually be flipped. And I know this is a position that's a pretty unusual one, and it's not one that really has been very uh, advanced in the health policy literature so far. But it's one that I want to pursue because I think that there are so many troubling uses of this data now that we really have to start thinking about how do we redirect societal uses it toward the more positive ones and away from the more negative ones. So we can come back to that, to that in Q&A because I'm sure there'll be tons of questions and answers on that one. Next is the professional pipeline dilemma. Okay, and I'll go through this a little bit more quickly. With professional pipelines, there's an issue where a lot of AI in medicine is based on a cost containment framework that would prescribe the replacement of professionals, right? There the AI dream would be, rather than going to a dermatologist and paying a $30 copay and having your insurer pay you know, $70 or $100 for the visit, you down download a $2.99 app, right? And that sort of is your dermatological visit, or you just sort of can scan your body so you don't have to go to your annual dermatological exam or something like that, right? I think that that is, those sorts of things are positive developments in medicine and should be encouraged, but that we need really good dermatologists and other experts to be able to understand how well that technology is working and how to make it work better. So I'm going to try to prescribe a version of complementarity here to say that we need to think of this technology as complementing people, not necessarily replacing them. And I'm going to focus first on some areas in mental health. If you look at a, an entity called Wobot, this is something that was released by some folks in Silicon Valley with respect to helping people that have uh, certain uh, either symptoms of depressive or other disorders, mental health disorders. With the Wobot, one of the ideas here is that it could be direct to consumer. People would download this app and it would be a chat bot that would sort of work them through different mental health scenarios, right? And I think that that is something that can be helpful to certain individuals, but I don't want us to think of it as the end point of mental health apps, right? I want us to think of it as maybe being something that we use in order to help people out when, let's say, the middle of the night and they can't reach their therapist. 
Uh, maybe it's something that we use in, say, rural areas where there's no therapist uh, nearby or where telehealth is not particularly pervasive. But in the long run, I think another vision is one of app as prescription, right? Rather than app as replacing a doctor or replacing a therapist, putting forward an app that could be used as, that could be prescribed, and through that prescription, actually be something that is monitored by a licensed health professional. And this is one of the first um, mental health apps actually um, approved by the Federal Dr Food and Drug Administration. It's called Reset, and it's for opioid use disorder. And this is sort of used, this is an app that's prescribed for, I believe, 84 days after someone has seen a licensed provider in addiction treatment. This is so important, too, and it's really close to my heart because so much of opioid use disorder is a problem that is being mishandled online. Lots of people are going onto Google searching for opioid use addiction uh, clinics, and they're being directed to fly-by-night, really uh, uh, unqualified, unlicensed providers. And what's amazing, at first they were being directed online to these groups because those groups were the ones that had the money to pay for the Google ads, right? And this is a classic story, right? If you're not spending money on actually licensed therapists and licensed uh, uh, substance abuse counselors, you have a lot more money to spend on marketing on Google, right? It's sort of a grim reality of the marketing here. So the Google said, ended up saying, we're not going to take ads for this, but then they had user-generated content that was also hijacked by the same people that were trying to, that were originally buying places online. I think that's really troubling. We have to try to avoid that, and part of avoiding that is making these things prescriptions as opposed to replacements. I'd finally say that even in areas where, like radiology, where you'd think that's pure pattern recognition, and where Jeff Hinton has essentially said to radiologists, Jeff Hinton is one of the leading AI researchers. He has can't come up with some of the leading algorithms that are used across the world now. Um, and he's up in Toronto. And he was asked about the future of radiology. And he said that radiologists are, have you ever seen the Roadrunner cartoon like with Wile E. Coyote as he goes past the cliff? He says radiologists are like Wile E. Coyote who have just gone past the cliff. There should not be a single radiologist trained today. They're all going to just collapse and be completely replaced by machines. But I read the radiology literature, and they're not saying that. And I don't think they're just not saying that because they're talking their book, right? <laughs> I think they're saying that because they realize that as advances in the imaging of the body uh, occur, and this is, you know, some simple versions of x-rays and things, you're going to have things going beyond uh, PET scans, positive, positive positron emission tomography, you're going to have different things that are going to be very uh, sophisticated forms of lighting and otherwise analyzing changes in human tissue. The question of how you integrate all those things is quite complicated. Now, I'm not saying that radiologists will be doing the same thing in 10 years that they were doing 20 years ago. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, I think there's some great visionaries there like Saurabh Jha and Eric Topol have written an article saying that both radiology and pathology may well integrate eventually into a combined information specialty in medicine. But I do think that medicine is much more than pattern recognition, stimulus, and response. And, and I've just talked about diagnosis. If you think further about how you talk someone through what to do about a medical problem, that's a whole nother skill set, right? But I think machines are very far from actually taking on and actually sort of being able to guide people through completely. I think it's something that needs more of the human touch. Okay. And that's part of why my work is rebalancing this automation discourse. I think overall, you have lots of books like those that are on the left side of these slides that sort of say the rise of the robots, the robots are coming, they're going to replace everybody, et cetera. And what I'm trying to do is to say, no, there's actually a lot going on in healthcare that really requires some very thoughtful integration of human and machine. And we've got to focus on how to do that well, as opposed to just trying to feed in more and more data into uh, the machines. Now, here's what I think will be my most controversial set of claims tonight. And this is on the cost dilemma. So if you follow the history of health services research over the past 25, 30 years, uh, something called the triple aim, which is uh, Don Berwick's key term, has been the key. So what's the triple aim? Triple aim is that you need to lower costs, improve health, and get better care for everyone. That cost, quality, and access. You can raise quality, you can expand access, and you should be reducing costs as you're doing that. And certainly, if you go back to my first slide, thinking about how much the U.S. spends on its GDP on healthcare, you'd think that's the case, right? I mean, especially comparing how much we spend to other countries. And yes, there is lots of fraud and abuse that's been out there that's been reduced, and there's lots of overtreatment, like Shannon Brownlee's famous book on overtreatment. It's a brilliant case studies 
brilliant set of case studies about how so many people are being overtreated in the healthcare system. But I want to say that, you know, there's going to be many areas where data-informed medicine will actually require more resources, not less. And that rather than less being more, less will be less. <laughs> and I think that we've got to take this very seriously about how we reframe the future of healthcare. And I want to reframe the cost problem in healthcare from one of overspending on healthcare in general to one of not spending optimally, right? And I'll give one challenge is that if for every person you can give me who's overpaid in healthcare, I'll give you five that are underpaid. <laughs> and here, let's start with that. With respect to avatars and virtual care, this is a, a case study that's coming out of Massachusetts with respect to uh, avatars. And um, uh, this is a, an issue where a lot of people who are part of the Medicaid program on comprehensive care are lonely. There's a real issue in terms of them not having a social support network or others to help support them in their situations at home. And what MassCare has done is that they've helped promote these avatars. And this, of course, isn't total AI, but you can see how it's building up to AI. What the avatar does is that through that little camera on the phone, it's watching the elder, but it's not actually a computer program watching them. It is uh, three or four remote workers in India who are watching. And the remote workers can speak to the elderly person via the avatar. So their voice is translated into the, into the avatar's voice and can say things like, as you see, I think you're a great friend or something like that, right? And there's a tribute, there's a, a, some very elementary work done on this in terms of like journalism. Journalists have sort of talked about this. But if you think about this as the future of elder care, I mean, some people from a cost containment perspective would say, this is what we need. Right? We need to have basically conditioned elderly people to understand that they are not valuable enough in society to merit human labor, but instead should be treated by sort of computational simulations of human labor. Right? I don't think that's a good future. Right? I think that actually we need to, uh, we, that this is a type of innovation that needs to complement human labor rather than replace it. For an example of that, um, the PARO is a robotic seal in Japan. Okay? This is an example, this is a, a robotic seal that is released to elderly people and it sort of mews like a pet, it blinks its eyes, it sort of can make expressions expressing either that it wants to be petted, that it wants to uh, go away, that it wants to sleep, et cetera. This is something that actually has been used in many scenarios, but there's been empirical research done that shows that when it is used in conjunction with a licensed caregiver who tries to create conversation around the PARO, interaction around the PARO, and tries to sort of think of it as something supplementing their caregiving role rather than replacing them, that it has much better outcomes. Now, what are the outcomes? Some of the outcome measures involved measuring cortisol in the elderly uh, persons who are affected by it. I don't think that's a great way of measuring outcomes, right? I think, that, but I do think that you can actually sort of watch people involved with these sort of machines, and you can say you can sort of uh, uh, develop what I would uh, encourage is more qualitative narrative visions of what is a positive sort of interaction of care um, that seems more community-oriented rather than one that is simply driven by cost pressures, right? So that's sort of an idea about PARO, and we're going to be making these very difficult decisions about how to deploy AI and robotics in healthcare. Um, another is, here's another good example of healthcare that I think doctors in the audience will really appreciate. According to some uh, estimates, a doctor in a 10-hour ER shift has to make 4,000 clicks on an ER electronic health record system. Right. This is overwhelming work. Primary care physicians say that they're spending 38 hours a month after hours on data entry work. Okay. That's pretty overwhelming, and it's a phenomenon widely known called shadow work, um, unpaid, unseen jobs. Right? And it's why a lot of doctors are burnt out. They're sick of health care. They want to get out of it because they feel like, I went into this wanting to look into the eyes of patients and to cure them and to help them, and instead I'm spending all my time typing into a laptop, you know, trying to sort of transcribe what they're saying. Now, one solution is to bring in scribes, okay? You can bring in human beings to come in and try to keep track of things, try to write things down, et cetera. And there's right now a very vigorous debate going on in the technology and medicine community about whether that's a good thing or whether it is, as a Harvard Business Review article recently said, pure medieval, like purely medieval. Right? They say that we should just try to leapfrog into a world where it's pure speech recognition and just there's recordings and then they're converted to text and that we just get rid of the human involved, right? But I'm sure any of you that have used Siri probably have a sense of why the, the shortcomings of that, right? You know, it's like a lot of this stuff is just not ready for prime time. 
And maybe eventually it will be. And perhaps using scribes will help it to become ready for prime time, right? Maybe it's going to be a complementarity situation. But I think we have to be really careful about trying to leapfrog into a totally automated future. Um, this is a phenomenon widely observed in science and technology studies. Sometimes it's called photomation, F-A-U-X-tomation, right? Sometimes it's called um, Potemkin automation. But it's all about the situations where we need people behind the machines to make sure that they're doing it right. And I think that's very important here. So my final set of points is you might say, well, my God, you're just you're trying to pile more costs onto a system that's already incredibly costly. What are you saying? And this is something that's often known as the cost disease, right? There's, uh, in economics, we often hear about the cost disease in services, that healthcare and other services co keep costing more and more. This is the price index, as you can see from the slide. I'm sorry for the, the, the individual parts of it are very small, but it's just different parts of medical care and how much the cost has increased. And of course, the bottom line is costs in general or prices in general. But I want to propose that actually the cost disease can be seen in a rapidly automating society that has a fair amount of resources as the cost cure. And here's why. Baumol is the author, William Baumol is the author who is behind the idea of the cost disease. And he is often ref referenced as the person who said that it's a threat to our economy that services cost more and more over time, right? But he has said that even continual rises in the GDP share taken by the healthcare sector could be supported by developed economies. To give one classic example of this, in 1915, 70% of the US economy was agriculture, okay? And there were like 30% were services. And so you had the services gradually took over more and more as agriculture became cheaper and cheaper. I predict something very similar could happen with respect to human services in the contemporary economy. That you could have them taking up more and more of the economy as economic slack is generated by everything else being automated. I remember I gave a talk on automation just a few, year, a few days ago, and uh, someone asked me, what are you gonna do with the millions of drivers that are now being out of work because of uh, automated cars, right? What are you gonna do with all these people that are gonna be in the mines that are gonna be put out of work by automated mining, automated uh, uh, power lines production, automated digging, all sorts of automated, automated farming. What are you gonna do with all these people? And my answer is that a lot of them are going to be absorbed by the healthcare sector, sector in a humane society, right? I think that's basically where it's going. So I don't think this is necessarily too radical a point, but it is a radical point to economists. Okay? So I worry that if we had austerity in healthcare, we could have a downward spiral in economic activity, and that the cost cure, not the cost disease, is to sustain growth in healthcare and to invest in the incredible advances in medicine that are in the offing if we're willing to put money in them. Now. How can we explain that as a potential future for the US economy? Well, here's a slide that I just wanted to explain in terms of, maybe I'll explain it based on this slide, I'll point to it. Okay. Here is from 2005. Oh, actually, this is recorded, so I have to be at the microphone. So I come back to the microphone, sorry. Um, if you look at the GDP share of healthcare and the rest of the economy, here's the year 2005. And it's like 15% versus 85%. By the way, this has already gone up to, I believe, 17% at this point, right? So it's already gone up a bit in the past five years. And what Baumol does in his book, The Cost Disease, is he extrapolates to the year 2105 based on about a 2% growth in US GDP. Okay? Through the miracle of compound interest, the, US, the GDP is much, much higher in 2105 than it is in 2005, right? Now, of course, all sorts of terrible things could happen. You know, there could be climate collapse. There could be all sorts of you know, <laughs> terrible things could bring down the GDP. But assuming something like that happens, he says also, if you look at the cost growth in healthcare, instead of healthcare taking 15% of the economy as it did in 2005, by 2105, it'll take 62%. Okay. Now you can imagine most economists would run out of the room saying, this is a nightmare, it's terrible, right? But what he shows is, if you look at the comparison on the next uh, uh, graphic there, is that even if we lived in a world where healthcare took 62% of the GDP in 2105, given the compounding interest and compounding of the GDP itself, there'd still be more money for everyone to do everything else than there is now. People would still have a higher living standard. So this is a really interesting question, right? It's a, he's asking the question of like, what do we want the economy to look like in the very long term? And this is what's missing, I think, in a lot of the cost disease discourse. People are not thinking about the very long term, they're not thinking about if we control healthcare costs, 
we're going to end up having other sectors of the economy maybe taking that up or maybe not taking that up, maybe leading to deflation and austerity. So I think we need to invest in healthcare services professions, and that's a question, and, and the reason why we should is because we've got to have people co-governing technological diffusion. We can't just sort of say technological technology goes of its own accord and then people sort of respond to it. We need people co-governing it, and that's very important. I realize I'm running out of time, so I just want to make one uh, even more provocative point with respect to the politics of healthcare. Here it is. If you, I, I compare in this slide two graphics that are sort of indicative of what were the healthcare plans first of the GOP in 2018, and second, what we might get under sort of a democratic presidency in 2021 if that happens. You look at the 2018 one, that was mainly the healthcare policy there was to really cut Medicaid to give a high income tax cut. Okay, that's the bottom line. The big transfer in 2018 proposed in the American Healthcare Act that almost passed the Congress would have ended the Medicaid expansion in 2020 in order to repeal the 3.9% tax on investment income for income above 250,000. 3.9%, some, it's about that number, right? I think uh, it's about, you know, 3, 4% 3, on investment income, right? So if you look at this, what this uh, graphic from Vox does, this is, just says that, you know, the 400 highest income households, those are households making at least $100 million per year. That's not their wealth. That's how much they make each year. So um, they would basically take $33 billion from that uh, approach, and that would have ended Medicaid for 725,800 people. So... <laughs> Right. So that is the healthcare policy that was sort of being advanced in 2018 that almost passed Congress, right? Um, it was very much supported by the president, would have been signed, uh, et cetera. Uh, and clearly, you know, from the gist of my talk, I'm not supporting that, right? <laughs> I think keep Medicaid going so we can pay um, the salaries of the fantastic people that are trying to not only save our lives, but give us all more extended and happier and healthier times on earth. But I'm also worried by the folks that try to market Medicare for all by saying that it's going to be cheaper than the status quo, right? I very much worry about that because I feel like if you promise people, well, just get on Medicare for all and we're going to do that, it ignores some of the big macroeconomic dynamics in our healthcare system, one of which is that a lot of hospitals can make it because they're being underpaid by uncompensated care, certainly. They're got, not getting anything off of uncompensated care. And remember, there's still 10 to 15 million Americans that have no coverage whatsoever, right? They're being undercompensated by Medicaid. They're constantly having their margins shizzled down by Medicaid. They're being undercompensated by Medicare, too. Not by a huge amount, but they are. And certainly with pay-for-performance reforms, they're going to be underpaid even more. And they make that up by charging private payers more. Right? Like basically private insurance, people paying private insurance are paying 120, 130% of costs, whereas Medicare, Medicaid may be paying 90, 95, 98% of costs. So you can't sort of say, okay, we're going to just switch the whole system onto a Medicare type of uh, funding level and expect to have the type of healthcare that we have now. It's just, it's very hard, I think. Um, uh, there's, and I, I know particularly working with admins and lawyers whose whole job is income preservation for healthcare professionals, right? So this is something I think we have to think very deeply about. Now, I am for covering everybody. I am for policies like that would definitely expand care, but I think we've got to be very careful about marketing them as cost-cutting cut as opposed to marketing them as quality improvement and access expansion. So my final examples, I guess I, I'm just going to, I'm not going to give these last two examples because I just want to get to my final slide, which is our three dilemmas. So... I, what I went through in tonight's talk, and I really appreciate your uh, sticking with me on this late night talk or this night talk, is that the data dilemma, I think, can be solved. The data dilemma is that there's both good and bad uses of data. They intensify with each passing year, and that we need to essentially flip the presumption and create a social license for good data use and to stop the bad data uses. The professional pipeline dilemma is that we are trying to replace more and more professionals, and that with, when we replace them, we are lacking in personnel that can help us improve for the future. The solution, I believe, is to support intelligence augmentation as much as AI, to support complementary technology as much as substitutive ones. And in terms of the cost dilemma, what I've tried to say tonight is I don't think it's a dilemma at all. <laughs> so I've, I'm trying to say we should move from a cost disease frame to a cost cure frame. So with that, I really look forward to, the, uh, to our talks, and I really look forward to uh, our conversation after. So thank you.
Right, so next up, we will have um, our Dr. Orman, who's an instructor in neurological sur surgery in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. Well, next up, we'll have Dr. Costa, sorry, yes, yes. Dr. Costa is an accomplished computational scientist with highly interdisciplinary background and is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuros Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Health System. He is the director of the Neurosurgery Simulation Core for the Department of Neurosurgery at the Icon School of Medicine. And then we'll also be hearing from Dr. Orman, and Dr. Orman is an instructor of neurological surgery in the Mount Sinai Health System and director of AI Sinai, Mount Sinai's AI research group. So I just want to thank them so much for being here tonight and for providing the perspective of the practitioner to us in law and policy. So thank you. And I will try to get my Thanks very much for, for inviting me. It's really a thrill to be here. So thank you to uh, Professor Pasquale and Professor Porter for organizing this event. Um, this is a, certainly a unique event for me. This is, I think, definitely the first talk at the event of a law school before. Um, so, um, so before we get started, I just have a couple of disclosures that are relevant to the device space here, uh, in case that's relevant to, to anyone if it comes up. Um, so um, I, uh, I have the privilege of working with a lot of spectacular people in the nursery department. Eric is, is, is one of them, um, where we work on the, uh, the AI group, the ASI and I put consortium together. Um, but I wanted to take like a, you know, just five minutes and take a more uh, 10,000 foot view kind of on innovation in medicine with an academic uh, medical system. Um, because my day job um, is the director of bi biodesign, our Sinai Biodesign program, uh, which is an early stage uh, medical device incubator. Um, we generally work with um, ideas that come out of clinician, I mean, domain expert clinician um, labs and, and their clinical practices and try to find ways to reduce those to practice, uh, both um, obviously in the interest of, of serving patients, um, but um, also to you know, generate commercially viable inventions that, that can make their way to the market. Um, and so uh, you might ask what, what biodesign is. Um, and some, if you've heard of biodesign before, you've probably heard of Stanford Biodesign. They pretty much invented the field. Um, and we are modeled to some extent off of them, although with critical differences. Um, but the idea behind uh, a biodesign program in an academic medical center, or really any medical center with, uh, um, with an academic bent, um, is to develop some kind of semi-formal pipeline or process uh, by which you can innovate medical technologies uh, through understandable goals. You reduce a process of understanding a need and all of the various stakeholders involved in that process um, into an idea that scopes um, that scopes you know, what your invention might be, what the outcome that you actually want from that invention to be, uh, in many ways completely devoid of any technological specifics whatsoever. Now, we're, we generally work in labs where uh, we have some degree of technological expertise in our biodesign group. Uh, we have a lot of expertise in the neurointerventional space. We work a lot in catheters. We know how to build those, things like that. Um, but generally, when we think about med tech innovation, we start from the framework of need only and tech later. Um, and in the very worst case, you can come back and you can maybe fill in the need after you have some technology. And of course, that happens all the time. Um, but, um, but that need is really, really fundamental. And especially coming from a hospital system, that's true. Uh, because generally, the hospital <laughs> system or the healthcare provider are the people who know how to define the need and to know how to define the value proposition of what you're, uh, of what you're uh, talking about. Certainly they are you know, the buyers of these technologies that might actually come in and, and, and have an effect in a hospital system like ours. Um, at the same time, that's true, um, where hospital systems can, you know, because of their domain expertise, uh, define the need, define the value. Hospital systems aren't exactly known as spectacular innovators. Um, you know, at least historically. I'm saying this as the lead of an innovation group at a hospital system, so I probably shouldn't be saying that publicly. I'm glad I'm on camera. Um, but nonetheless, that's not historically the way that academic hospital systems has been thought of. Uh, but yet at the same time, we talk about things how, uh, you know, technology innovation and technology uh, translational work within a health sector system is the way that we're going to evolve. Um, even though we know full well that we're not all that good at doing that in a hospital system, and we, we need a lot of help from a lot of different kinds of parties. Um, so what do we do then? Um, and we do start with this, this needs-based approach. And I have a couple of figures here from a famous book in this area, which is aptly called Biodesign. It's from the Stanford group, Paul Yock and his colleagues. 
Um, and they reduce it down to really three or four basic questions that you have to answer uh, before you come up with something that is going to be attractive uh, to, um, to someone who's shopping around for a technology uh, translationally within a hospital system, and that is you need to define the problem, you need to define the population, you need to define the outcome, and note that the technology does not appear in this statement in any way, shape, or form. So what do you do when doing that? And you know, I'll talk, uh, I mean, this will take five seconds, um, but there are huge numbers of programs, whether it's the NSF, NSH, DOE, you know, actually that's true, DOE as well, um, that have programs that are specifically tuned for this kind of customer discovery across every single interested stakeholder in the field. And in fact, there are members of my group, one of which is here right now, uh, who are engaged in this process um, you know, through, through the NSF. Um, so lots of people to consider, right? Um, and probably the obvious ones, patients, providers, and others in the healthcare system. These are people that we encounter every single day. We generally have you know, facile access to them, uh, especially coming from you know, uh, an academic uh, appointment and a group that's, that, that's funded inside of Mount Sinai. Um, but there are many others that maybe we don't have as facile access to. Um, and so you'll see here patients, you know, fit into this unmet need, uh, but as do their families, as do efficacy groups, as do access to the physicians themselves, um, facility administrators, public payers, obviously these are people who make the decisions about whether or not you can actually scale a translatable technology inside of a health system, uh, and they contribute significantly to your understanding of whether or not you're going to be able to innovate a technology and get it into, get it into the public, get it into public use. Um, of course, there are a number of things that you need to build once you understand all of those different, um, once, once you understand all of those uh, different people who are gonna have an effect on um, whether or not you can scale your technology. And these are somewhat more typical, right? These are not, um, these are things that almost any company would, would do. They would understand a lot about the disease state fundamentals. That's something that we're pretty good at inside of a health system. Uh, they would understand an existing solutions. This is also true. We can go into our operating rooms, we can go into the clinic and we can understand uh, how technology is being leveraged in each one of these cases. Um, stakeholder analysis I, I, I mentioned, and then and market work as well, which is, which is a big part of uh, what happens in the group. Um, let's skip this slide briefly. So I'm sorry for the formatting here up at the top left. Um, but this is a process that has been really shown to work well. Um, and there's been quite a lot of investment in the development of these kinds of groups within hospital systems like ours, again, Stanford being, you know, sort of the, uh, the canonical um, group in this area. Uh, and they've had a huge, huge amount of success. Um, they've They've uh, started many, many companies. Many of them have had successful exits or at least successful raises and then have actually gotten to the point of selling products. So what does that look like for us? Um, so this is, this is the slide that I generally put up when, um, <laughs> when I wanna make a joke about how all the people that work in the group kind of hate me because this is how my brain works about the process of getting a technology in through the group and then all the way through these phases. We don't really actually do this. Um, <laughs> in, in, in practice because it is just too complicated. Uh, we just a long time ago, but you know, there are a lot of people who implement a version of this. A couple of them are here today uh, on a regular basis. And generally what we end up with in our group is we focus a little bit more on devices. Again, this is my day job. Um, and so this is an example of a technology that was built for treating uh, <clears throat> cerebrovascular malformations uh, that is currently being spun up into a startup. I was hoping Kurt was going to be here, actually. He's the CEO of this company that's starting out of the group. Um, but these are the kinds of technologies that we happen to be expert in, and we've built these long-term relationships with these, these providers um, so that we can you know, deeply understand their needs and, and innovate these technologies. So that was you know, five, six, seven minutes where I haven't talked about AI at all, and we're here at an AI, uh, AI meeting. Uh, so what's the point? Um, and I think a lot of the kinds of things that... Uh, I've said about the way that we work on medical technologies are really scalable, whether it's a digital technology or whether it's a um, device technology. And I definitely have some questions about cost disease and the relationship of uh, physical or device technologies versus, uh, di versus digital technologies later, which will be fun. Um, but <clears throat> in general, if you're familiar with the, you know, this kind of stuff in AI, AI and medicine at all, you probably have seen a lot of headlines like this, right? So I mean, all sorts of things about how you know, AI is taking over the world and is going to, um, you know, outperform all the radiologists, all the things that Jeff Hitton said a few years ago, and, and uh, maybe, a, maybe we should think twice about. Um, but this is very common, right? And, and this is the way that, it, in many cases, this is the way that engineers think. I'm guilty of this, too. I spent most of my postdoc just making things slightly, slightly better um, from an engineering standpoint. And the reality is this is not the way that we think about problems in medicine. Um, and uh, it's not the way that we need to think about them if we're going to have 
uh, a direct patient impact. So it's not what a needs finding process is. It's not what biodesign is really about. And so what is biodesign really about? And how does this work in an AI context? And I'm just gonna give a single, a single example and huge props to Eric, who of course is the lead on this study that I'm about to mention, then he's gonna to talk to you about a bunch of other things. But we defined, you know, by going into the clinic and understanding um, each one of these different things, we then, uh, we then come up uh, with a formulation for understanding what particular intervention could have the impact that we want if we move a technology into the field. And so that's, what do you observe? This is kind of the interview process that we go through in, inside the health system to find the problem, to find the population you're gonna treat and to find what the outcome is. And again, I'm not talking about a technology yet. It happens to be an AIBS solution in this case, but I haven't actually mentioned a specific technology. So what do you observe? Now, I'm actually not gonna read through all of this in, in, in detail because there's a lot of words on the next couple slides and I know that this is gonna be shared with you so you can use that later. Uh, but in our particular case, uh, we're thinking about patients that have acute neurologic events and how to get them to their treatment as quickly as possible, right? So we go through the process of observing lots of things that happen in the hospital system and identifying a problem that can be addressed. This is not specifically what we're going to do, um, but it is something that defines the scope of what a solution would address. Um, so in this case, time to scan, then to triage, and then to, in some cases, a, an interventional suite um, in the case of, for example, an ischemic event, uh, a neuro ischemic event. Um, population, this is reasonably well defined. Uh, these are patients that come into the ED and they have symptoms of stroke and so are triaged that way, uh, which is a purely imaging based process, which lends itself nicely to a uh, purely pattern matching <laughs> approach to, <laughs> to AI. Um, and what our desired outcome is, and we can define that well. The reason you go through that process is because it really forces you to ask the relevant questions of each one of those un underlying people. So you have patients and health systems, providers, uh, and physicians, all of which have a stake in how a patient moves from the operating room into an interventional suite for treatment. Um, and so performing these interviews of all of these different uh, people and really understand, in our, in our case, we're deeply embedded in the system. From an external observer, you'd come into the health system and you'd really you know, try to deeply understand the, the, the problem uh, by making all of these individual interviews, is that there's an opportunity, right? What if we could use an artificial intelligence uh, agent to reorder a work queue uh, for CT triage in the sense that a radiologist, instead of getting a first in, first out of patients that come into the emergency room, we could do nothing much more complicated than just make sure that person sees the most emerging cases first. Right? And note that I'm not, I'm not asking the, the, the AI to be better than a radiologist. I'm not asking it to outperform any particular part of the healthcare system right now. I'm asking it to augment the way an existing infrastructure works and that scales very nicely within the context of, of the way the healthcare system works now. And this is exactly what uh, we did and, and published last year um, and led to a prospective clinical trial, a double blind RCT, um, uh, a simulated prospective RCT, um, where we're able to show some of, these, uh, some of these improvements. It also works really nicely for press too, if that's your thing. Um, just like all of the things about making things 99.99% accurate in the healthcare system. But ultimately, I think that my, my overall point is that you know, engineering feats are nice, but they don't help you scale technologies within a health system. And this kind of approach actually allows you to address those things directly uh, and have an impact in a way that, um, you know, an isolated technology doesn't. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Arman. Also, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to law school. My dad's a lawyer and so. <laughs> decided to be back in the family. Um, I do have some disclosures as well. I'm actually going to abandon my slides for a second to talk about something that you made me think of, uh, Professor Pasquale, and which I'm going to name right now, Berwick's triple fail. <laughs> and um, specifically, it's our experience with mammography in the 1990s. So you know, you can picture in the 1990s, Compute, personal computers, computers are first coming out into society, and especially into medicine. And at the time, even with you know, the very fancy medical imaging technologies like MRIs, the culture was still taking images and hanging them up on a whiteboard and doctors looking at them. But now in the 90s with the personal computers, suddenly all these images are getting digitized and they're on computers and radiologists can work with them. And one of the very first things that everyone got excited for was with finding ways of using computers to improve how we did mammography and for women's health to look for breast cancer. 
And so a lot of very smart researchers set, got together all of their now digital mammograms and they built algorithms to look for calcifications and look for lesions that could be harbingers of breast cancer in women. And it turns out that if you do this on your homegrown data set, which is in a certain patient population, taken on certain scanners in a certain way, you can develop algorithms that do this fairly well in the mid-90s. And actually, the FDA ended up approving this technology in 1998, uh, computer-assisted diagnosis for mammograms. Not stopping there, five years later in 2003, CMS approved this technology for reimbursements and they actually made a CPT code for it so doctors could bill for it. Over the next decade, computer-assisted diagnosis, which in the FDA filings had a increased accuracy for finding these lesions by two to 10%, became standard for mammography, adding an annual bill of about $400 million spent on mammograms. It turns out that actually though, when you take those algorithms and in post-market studies sort of now, phase four studies see how well they work on other people's data or data that's been acquired now and not the retrospective stuff you've been studying on that they actually don't work at all. They actually don't increase your ability to detect breast cancer. And in fact, there's a lot of false positives since so they might in some sense maybe not decrease your access but unfortunately expose you or give you access to biopsies which you don't need. And ultimately... I want to say in just the past two or three years, CMS actually pulled the CPT code. But you know, until two or three years ago, we were paying $400 million a year for a computer technology which actually wasn't working or, if anything, was decreasing our quality of care, increasing our costs, and, if anything, providing bad access. So, well, I think, for me, one of the things that a lot of people almost assume that Bearwick's triad applies to software technologies, you know, software is cheap. It's there, you install it on your computer. But if anything, there's very real cases of software being the exact opposite. So to quickly go through my slides, my background, I'm a neurological surgeon. I'm also a software engineer. I used to work for Google. And I really like to break things down into clinical versus technical problems. And clinical problems are where we think of these technologies as working with clinicians or perhaps in uh, lieu of clinicians to tackle problems, often in diagnosis. A lot of these classic problems you talk about in radiology, you know, replacing radiologists, replacing pathologists, diagnosing things on pathology slides and so forth. And the other are technical problems. My favorite example is actually from our neighbors downtown at NYU Langone, Fast MRI, where the idea is simply, how do they make MRI scanners work faster? For anyone who's had an MRI scan, especially of one of their brains, they're very unpleasant, they're very loud machines, and that you can sometimes be in there for you know, 30 minutes. For some of the big studies that we do in neurosurgery, up to an hour. And so a technical problem is, how do you just make that faster? And I think, when you think about the impact of these technologies in clinical care, to me, the most interesting problems are often these technical ones because they actually only serve to often augment care or in many ways they, they skirt around some of these issues of data privacy or access because they're really technically nitty-gritty technical details of medicine rather than actually medical tasks themselves. So some examples I have here, which I won't belabor the points of clinical tasks would be, for example, automating assessments in an ICU, or an example of a technical task, which is actually in production, and this is being sold by Olympus right now, would be increasing the resolution of microscopy. So you can see here, here's a microscopic image taken at 10 magnification. On the right is at 20, and in the middle is at 10 that's been enhanced by a super resolution deep neural network. To me, actually, the one in the middle looks a little bit better than the actual high mag image. Similarly, Subtle Medical, which is a startup out in California. Here's a three Tesla MRI with some slight motion artifact. You can see here's the white matter and the gray matter and these slightly blurry lines between them. Here's the exact same MRI scan, again, enhanced with the super resolution deep neural network. These are technical things, just changing how the MRI looks or how the imaging looks, which are then secondarily interpreted by humans. I think these are, there's a lot of promise of these technical solutions as opposed to some of the clinical ones, and I think there's a very different set of legal issues surrounding them. So another point that I always get into are 
the nature of labels in medicine, especially as a physician, and there's a lot of things actually to talk about labels in medicine, which we won't get into, but for how we label data, you know, especially in computer science, we do a lot of work with all sorts of data sets of photos of natural things, cats, dogs, cars, and so forth. And it's usually people are pretty sure what they're looking at when it's a cat or a dog or a car. But how about doctors when they're looking at images? So at Google, one of the big projects was in diabetic retinopathy. And when this study was conducted to find out if these images of people's eyes had retinopathy, they had ophthalmologists, eye surgeons, look at them. As part of gathering the data from the eye surgeons, though, and every day the eye surgeons were given a pile of images to look through, and some of the images on a given day would be from the prior day that they already looked through. It turns out that your ophthalmologists agree with themselves about 70% of the time, which really calls into question the nature of gold standard labels. You know, I often say that I think in the many diagnostic tasks in medicine, they're fool's gold. So the, what is ground truth then in medicine? I think it's quite fungible. However, on the question of data, if we ignore the fact now that maybe we don't even have gold standard labels in medicine, or at least there's a lot of error naturally built into them, what if you're only working with silver standard labels in computer science or often ones that we get via some heuristic? We're not having people look at the images, but maybe we're using some other algorithm to generate the labels off some other source of data. A classic one used at many major tech companies would be to go through images in Google Images and look at the captions and use the captions to label the images, assuming that there's some correlation between the two. You can do this and generate massive data sets. So the ImageNet is probably the most famous image data set of natural images. It's about 2 million images, and it's, of course, just natural things, cars, dogs, trucks, et cetera. If you go through Google Images, you can generate something, for example, this thing we call the JFT300M. This is another study at Google Brain. So this is 300 million images, but it's all labeled heuristically using the captions. If you train an algorithm on these noisily labeled data and then test it on the gold standard labels from the ImageNet, you actually find that your noisy data from this massive data set actually works better and it works better for every possible task, for classification, for object detection, and for semantic segmentation. So sufficient quantities of noisy data actually can be better in some cases than small quantities of gold standard data. <clears throat> one of my big disclaimers, another computer science paper, is this one out of Berkeley. Here you can see photos which you all probably recognize, airplanes, taxis, upside down cars, cats. Each one's properly labeled by a state of the art image detection algorithm. I believe this is a ResNet. In the parentheses is the same, exact same algorithms predictions if you change a single pixel in the photos. That one in the airplane, that one in the taxi, that one on the cat makes it a dog. So, Usually when I'm talking to medical audiences, I always use this slide to point out that I know we call it artificial intelligence, even augmented intelligence, but there's really no intelligence involved. It's lots of linear algebra, which, but it's just lots of linear algebra. There's literally zero intelligence involved. And these things are actually very easily tricked. And if it's, granted, these things are generated by people intentionally to um, tool the network. But Beyond the fact that you could have such a thing, is this is a way suddenly to hack medical algorithms if you wanted to with adversarial examples. So there's a whole sec additional security question there. But also, if they're this easily fooled, how do we know that this works so well in nature? And one of the studies we actually did at Mount Sinai was we took an algorithm, we trained it to recognize pneumonia in our patients, and we trained it against the data set from everything in the Mount Sinai health system. So the outpatient clinics, the ICUs, the general floor patients. And these are all people getting chest x-rays. And it turns out that the algorithm doesn't really learn pneumonia as well as it learns where the x-rays are getting taken, which is highly correlated with pneumonia. It was great at identifying who was in an ICU and just labeling all those, predicting all those as having pneumonia, which is often correct. And everyone in an outpatient clinic is not having pneumonia. So clinically, it's pretty useless since we're often looking for those pneumonias in outpatient clinics. 
but the algorithm still does a really good job because ultimately the algorithms are only as good as the systems that we engineer to train them and to employ them. This is another project that we're working on unpublished, simply discussing how often, again, I think in the algorithm and kind of software engineering communities, the actual medical task is frequently misunderstood. In a lot of these radiology projects, you know, you have images and people are classifying them. You know, here's a chest x-ray. It's of pneumonia. Here's a brain MRI. It's of a brain tumor. That's not really what doctors do. They don't look at a chest x-ray of pneumonia. It's a chest x-ray of someone with pneumonia. It's not a brain MRI of a brain tumor. It's a brain MRI of someone with a brain tumor in their brain. Physicians do object detection. All those algorithms that a lot of people use do classification. And it's very different mathematics involved. And my example of this here is that if you do classification of children on images, this image ends up being a bucket using a state-of-the-art algorithm. Whereas if you appropriately do object detection, which mind you, to do object detection, you need bounding boxes, not whole image labels. So that's more costly to obtain. So you have to have someone manually draw them out. Only when you do object detection do you recognize the child. And here's just the dis difference in accuracy on a benchmark data set. 80% with classification, 90% with object, appropriate object detection. So you know, data is everything. I think the other speakers did a great job talking about that. And it's not just data, but also you know, how we use it, which hopefully I gave you some ideas about that. And the last thing I always like to remind people is that when people talk about costs for medical data, I always talk about this with my students that you know, we talk about a lot of data sets, especially like at Google, for example, you know, we're paying for data. We spend money, we get more data, we take more photos, which just is you know, money to photos, pay for people to label it, more data. Medical data actually is a human cost. You know, if we want more images of people with strokes, it's human beings having strokes. More images of brain tumors are human beings with brain tumors. And so ultimately, the cost of medical data isn't really in dollars, but it's in human lives. So using this appropriately, and really safeguarding and treasuring it for what it is, because people are paying for this with their lives, I think is not just a societal obligation, but it's really a moral one. So this is our team. It's an amazing team. Can't do any of this without everyone. And I think we're gonna have a discussion now. Well, thanks so much. I mean, that was really, uh, I think, illuminating in terms of what the cutting edge of the technology is here. and. I just, I, I think I'll just uh, take a moderator's prerogative and just ask a first question, and then um, open up, if you'd like to ask any questions of me or of each, uh, each other, that's great, and then we'll have uh, sort of a, a general audience uh, question. So the question I had was, I was recalling um, uh, your slide, Anthony, that was on the um, uh, triage, the triage potential, that you were not necessarily looking for a system that, with respect to people coming that we think have a stroke. And this is, by the way, this is quite a dramatic issue, right? Because, I mean, there's just so many, you've heard so many, I've, I've certainly heard so many stories of people going to the hospital with a stroke and just the difference is life or death within minutes, right? It's just like 20, 20 minutes could be the difference between life or death or between total paralysis of one side of one's body and a complete recovery. And by the way, there's an amazing book by the economist Robert H. Frank um, on luck, where he reflects on how lucky he was to get to the hospital on time <laughs> in exactly this sort of situation. Um, and, but I, was, I wanted to bring up about triage two points. One is, I actually recently published a piece with a coder about a proposed system to triage legal cases in the European Union. Hmm. And the issue there was that there are people that were trying to triage these, they are trying to use all the past cases in form of the European, European Union Court of Human Rights and say, okay, this court gets 1,000 submissions a year, it can only hear about 80, so let's sort of process through the submissions that were attached to winning claims and then compare them to future claims and then triage them. And of course, what me and my co-authors say is like that's totally inappropriate in law, right? Because it's just that the cases change, right? I mean, many of the cases in the past could have been against the government of Poland when it had a more authoritarian regime, but now the regime may be less authoritarian, it just doesn't make sense in law. It does seem to have a lot of promise in medicine, but, I mean, I think it's, medicine's totally different. But just this last week, I think Ruha Benjamin had a piece in Science Magazine where she was reporting on some concerns about the patient prioritization algorithm used by Optum Health, which she alleged caused, uh, was disproportionately delaying care to minority patients. Um, for a variety of issues involving health disparities in the healthcare system. And I guess my question would be, 
One thing that's come up in the financial context is an argument that before we deploy an algorithm in, alloc in allocating life insurance opportunity according to social media data, the New York Division of Financial Services says that you have to prove that this algorithm is, does not have a disparate impact on minority groups. Do you think that might be a good step in terms of like testing some of these triage algorithms to say that before releasing them that we would try to pretest them to see if they had a disparate impact on minority groups? Sure. I mean, I think that in general, bias is one of the most important issues that we often overlook in this space uh, as a whole. I mean, you know, Mount Sinai, we have a particular patient mix, right? Mm -hmm. So if we look retrospectively over six or 10 years or something like that at, at a sample of, uh, and understand the, you know, distribution demographics that we have there with the Mount Sinai data set, and then we go and we apply that somewhere else, which might have a slightly different patient mix. And this could be underlying racial disparities. It could be all sorts of other different types of disparities as well. Um, that are that are poorly treated. In fact, I mean, I was driving in this morning, and the WNYC had a you know piece on um, on a group, a uh, sort of a grassroots group uh, that was looking at uh, melanoma detection in people of color, and how there are very few examples of that, um, and that this is a huge problem. That even it, it took you know parents of of children who were involved in this to actually start this grassroots group that actually started to build data sets around. Um, you, know, you might have one in a thousand, and now it might be somewhat better than that. So, um, yeah, I mean, understanding those underlying distributions of your data with respect to uh, underlying health disparities, including um, you know uh, those inequities, I think is 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 fundamental. And and this is where you know, we really need to look at you know integrated types of approaches of generalized training of these models if we expect them to actually move to hospital B, hospital C, hospital D. Um, where the underlying patient mix is going to be that much different. And you probably have. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I guess the other question I, I guess I would ask before the um, uh, break, and I just wanted to thank you so much, Harry, for that example of the uh, uh, bad CAD or the bad computer assisted decision making, you know? And I mean, was, was this one where do you think that that could have been avoided if, say, the FDA had a more aggressive approach to licensing or permitting these things? Is that, is that maybe the solution, or would the, should there have been? I mean, I guess the big question is, could we have caught this earlier or no, with, the, with respect to the breast cancer algorithm that was just worse than chance or giving no effective, useful advice? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a very active area of, for the FDA you know, with the recent SAMD guidelines. Um, but even like, you know, in SAMD, I think you see the beginnings of steps that, if that was in place back in the mid-'90s when they approved it, they wouldn't, those algorithms wouldn't have been approved. Um, I think even now we've really sort of started to lay the framework for addressing that kind of issue. And I, I, I don't know anyone who's involved with Ryan, but I'm sure this was in pe on people's minds when they came up with the current regulations. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a huge issue. Well, great. Well, then, are there questions from the audience? Any, any questions out there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's a microphone if you'd like. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. They're not looking at the total picture, which includes the other things which are euphemistic we call the inflation determinants of health care, which if you add those four things, show maybe different numbers. And the argument is spend less on direct health care, more on housing, more on nutrition, more on education. Which will raise the uh, you know the 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 overall view of uh, you know the outcomes. Excellent. So I, I think I, I my own approach would be sort of both and. I think that you know I think that there's a real argument for doing those things. Certainly, the approach that you're advancing is something that I I see increasingly part of population health models that are being proposed, for example, in some Medicaid systems, you look at like Jeff Brenner's work with some of the Medicaid ACOs, the accountable care organizations, where they say to a hospital system, look, we want you, if you've got someone who's constantly coming in with asthma, we want to put it on you to hire someone to go to where they live and get them out of that lease and then move them to a place where they don't have black mold in their uh, uh, room, right? That is a good thing, and certainly it's something that you know medical legal, legal partnerships should be doing, that law schools could help have a role in, that uh, computer, community service organizations could have a role in. 
But I'm very worried about saying that there's some fixed pot of healthcare resources where we should take money, say, from innovative healthcare and put it into getting someone out of a moldy house, right? I think that that is, and, and one area where I think that the statistics about the overall health spending could be misleading is that yes, many of the other countries spend less as a percentage of GDP on healthcare, but they spend much more on, say, housing assistance, um, exactly doing the sort of social determinants of health things that you're describing. So, I mean, I think that's something that like in Denmark, in France, in uh, the UK, you'd have a lot more. I mean, the UK, for example, I don't know the extent to which, say, home visitors are included in the overall health spending there. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but a home visitor can do a lot to sort of help someone not feel lonely, to make sure that they're taking their pills, just to sort of create this general social support network. So I think that part of it has to be like, I am all for, say, uh, peeling off some money from the Pentagon to pay more for, you know, to pay more for um, uh, uh, some of these social determinants of health. And I totally believe in them. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a class actually this week where I'm discussing public health and going all into, you know, if you look at the other aspect of that that I think works into the first slide that I showed is, you know, why is the U.S. life expectancy so much lower? And I think some of that is due to bad health care or bad, bad access to health care. But some of it is due to just very troubling aspects of like living in violence, like living in living in situations where you have like uncontrolled gun sales, living in situations where you have, you know, other uh, um, uh, bad environmental factors. All these sorts of things are aspects of that that are you can't really put down to the healthcare system. You can't say to the healthcare system, well, you should have solved the fact that, you know, I, I come from Baltimore, that Baltimore has still hundreds of homes with lead paint in it, right? Although, actually, my the University of Maryland, I believe that we are reaching out to try to deal with that, you know, to try to deal with some of the issues of the ongoing lead paint disaster in the U.S., but um, or especially in Baltimore. But yeah, but I think that's social determinants of health are huge. But I hope that we can seek funding for them from sources other than the healthcare pot, because frankly, when I heard about these startups, I'm just like, wow, I want to see a lot of investment in there. And I'm like, SoftBank, why were you investing in WeWork when you could have been investing in this? You know, it's like, that's that's what I really want to get at is these VCs. Like, why are you investing in like these sort of silly things, you know, when you could be investing in something that would make sure that if a member of your family has a stroke, they get the relevant scan to know if they should take the TPA or not. You know, or there's, you know, if they, they know if it's hemorrhagic or if it's a blockage, you know, that's really a big deal. I mean, that's huge. And, and to, this is the most important work I think you could be doing. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting conversation. One of the things that strikes me, though, because of my own orientation, is how little One of, one of the things that I find striking is how little conversation there seems to be about the fundamentals of safety. That there's a, a lot about doing jobs and improving the jobs, but very little about the failure to do them safely. Now, I know that some of the sort of imaging materials and things of that sort will be safer by the nature of more accurate um, algorithms and so forth, but it seems to me that very little of the conversation, despite 400,000 deaths a year in hospitals and a variety of <coughs> other uh, uh, data which suggest a, a, a truly difficult problem, that very little of the technology is about just finding where the mistakes are, addressing the mistakes, identifying them, dealing with them. And I, I'd be really interested in, in all of your responses to that particular challenge. I think there actually, so there is, I say actually there is a decent amount of activity in the safety space. I think it's just that you don't really see a lot of it from kind of like the big players right now. A lot of it's in the startup sphere. Um, you know, but there are definitely startups looking at, um, you know, I've had some, there's startups looking at, for example, you know, counting surgical sponges and instruments so you know, there's nothing left behind in patients. I know of startups that are looking at reducing falls in people's homes and in hospitals. Um, you know, as well as startups looking at trying to find ways of you know ensuring people take the right medicines at the right time and don't have missed doses, especially in patients with dementia with this is a problem. So I think there there is a lot of focus on that kind of slice of the medical puzzle. It just it's not really 
it's you don't see it as much in the academic literature because it's some it's not as um, it's a little bit more challenging of a topic to publish on, and you don't see as much from like the big players just because I think they just don't see it as being such a big market as, for example, like radiology. There's no profit because what happens is the safer you are, the less treatment you can bill for. And you see in the same universe you described that sort of disincentive to move towards safer practice. And I wonder, you know, how does one get over that? I mean, you know, if you're a startup that no hospitals will buy because it doesn't, there's no good bottom line. I mean, how do, how do we academic medicine, academic law people encourage something that doesn't look like there's a business model for it? I mean, I, I guess I'd suggest that I think this is where maybe some of there's a virtue there for the pay for performance initiatives that we're seeing that pay for performance suddenly starts to create a market where, you know, safety has a direct financial benefit tied to it. Yeah, and if I could, I could build on that pay for performance point. I think it's a very profound one. You know, I think that there's, so I mean, one version of this would be to say that uh, there should be very, uh, if there's higher liability, corporate liability, like, um, and I, I skipped over this slide on this case called Thompson v. Nason out of Pennsylvania that sort of prescribed the fundamental duty of the hospital to keep for uh, see, keep its patients safe and offer effective care. And then it had four subduties, one of which in, what in, involves the uh, ensuring proper procedures and pro ensuring proper personnel and proper equipment, et cetera. All of those sorts of things would help, and I think there's been a certain lessening of that pressure thanks to tort reform, or you know what some have called tort deform, you know, <laughs> and then some of those areas. Um, another version of this, in talking about pay for performance, I think pay for performance is really interesting in terms of, for example, if you look at hospital readmission penalties. Okay, so you can what you can do, and what Medicare has done, and I think under the auspices of the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Innovation, they've said to hospitals, if you have a patient that comes back within a certain number of days or, or a week or so or whatever it might be, 30 days, sorry, yeah, 30 days, then we're going to really penalize you with respect to what type of payment you get for them. And that on one level is a positive incentive to them to try to offer care that really deals with the issue involved. On another level, it's also an incentive to avoid people that might be in that situation, right? To sort of say to, for example, the frail elder that comes from a nursing home, hey, get on back, we can't help you at all, you know, or something like that. It's also an incentive that it also, uh, even if it works well, it can be very troubling in that you can have a hospital that's very poor and have lots of people that don't have very many social supports. They go back and obviously they're going to, or I, I think that, you know, it's, it's pretty clear in the literature that those people without the social supports are going to be going back more often because they may not adhere to their medication regimen. They may have various difficulties at home getting proper nutrition, um, all sorts of issues. Then you've got to risk adjust. Okay? So then you've got to go into risk adjustment and say, okay, well, your hospital is in a poor area with less social support. Your hospital is in another area with more social support. But the risk adjustment thing can be very tricky. And one of the things that I used to talk about with people at CMMI was the rise of a consultant class of people who their main goal in, in consulting with the hospitals was helping them to identify patient populations that would appear sicker than they actually were. So that would take advantage of risk adjustment, right? <laughs> because of the, on some level. So this is really tricky. I, mean, I think that the question of like how to do this care is often really difficult with pay for performance. I mean, it's a good thing. But I think that um, I am... What's so strange about it is when I started teaching health law, I taught quality measures, according to Donna Bedian, are structure, process, and outcomes, right? You can either measure the structure of a hospital, of a healthcare setting, the process, what they do, or actual outcome measures of like how many people survive, how well do they do, how, uh, what is their level of functionality, et cetera. When I started, I taught that as a relatively unproblematic um, ascendance from the primitive way of measuring structure, to something that's a little better with process, to outcomes being what we really care about. The more I am part of the system and watch the gaming of outcome measures, like also as chronicled in this Jerry Muller book, The Tyranny of Metrics, the closer I come to thinking that you've got to have all three all the time, right? <laughs> that, that we don't just care about outcomes because they are gameable. And, but ultimately, to get back to your original question, we have to have safety outcomes be really valued with proper risk adjustment 
But I guess we also have to really invest a lot more in the diffusion of procedures and technology that can help uh, deal with these problems. And one last example I'd give that I'm kind of surprised by the lack of its diffusion is the germ-killing robot, right? There are certain robots that can kill germs, et cetera, and I sort of feel like that's a great example where they use these ultraviolet lights or other sorts of things, and you know, if that really works, if that really helps, like that could be a really big help in terms of avoiding certain forms of infection. But I think thinking outside the box about how to increase or how to avoid um, infections, mistakes, et cetera, is really powerful. Well, the final example there, I guess, would be the the check checklist example, Atul Gawande wrote a whole book about checklists, right? Sort of forcing people to use checklists. That's a really interesting question because part of it, it takes away your professional autonomy as a doctor to just do what you know what to do. And imagine if, you know, we as lawyers had to go through a checklist before every brief and be like, have we done this? Have we done this? Have we done this? You know, we might resist it. But on the other hand, when it is life or death, maybe we do want to make people, even if we are corroding the quality of their work experience by making it more routinized, perhaps the balance of values weighs in favor of the checklist and making that ultimately a standard of care. And so that's another example, I think, where we could do a lot more. Yeah. About bigger data. That, yeah. you know, how do you risk adjust? How do you break out of the hospital ceiling? It's always got to be about a bigger data field. And it is. That's what we don't seem to have. It is very much about bigger data. But let me give one example, though, about how um, the data is never raw data or brute data. And this is from an article in the New Atlantis by this uh, physician, Nick Barrowman, and, uh, and, and it's a really interesting sort of argument about how we, data, more data will help, but the, here's a really interesting um, issue with an epidemiology. I mean, there are certain groups in society that are uh, often, you, that that group will do better um, than other groups, right? And so, and, and yet, do you sort of risk adjust to say that if the hospital has a large number of people in that group, that we sort of credit their recovery more to them being part of the group or to the hospital? Right? And so this could be a really tricky, like I just wanted to point out like some of, some of the, the values questions that come up. But yeah, in general, I, I do think your point, that definitely um, uh, uh, sort of reinforces uh, the point about the unreasonable effectiveness of data, right? The more data, the more you will be able to get around these dilemmas. Yeah. Did you have anything to say about the safety, Anthony? I'm sorry to. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I think that it was extremely well covered. The only thing that occurred to me when you when you talked specifically about the case in radiology is that you know, we tend to fall into the trap of thinking that accuracy will solve all of our problems, and the relationship between accuracy and efficacy is well known not to be particularly straightforward. And I think that's probably true in safety as well. I say that with some confidence. Hey, uh, my name is David Beloche. Uh, just a quick question about. Uh, Professor Pasquale, I think you mentioned the um, because of the intersection of apps, technology, and medicine, it's going to create new information specialties or require new information specialties in medicine. Um, I wanted to push that a little bit further, uh, starting with a preface um, about the evolution of the game of chess and the integration of computers. Right? So first it started humans versus humans, they battled it out, then you added computers, human versus computer, the humans lost. And then they evolved where humans worked with computers, they called it a centaur. The centaur versus the lonely computer, the centaurs would win. And then they pitted centaurs against each other, but they figured out that the teams that won uh, and that controlled the centaurs were not the ones who were the greatest at chess, but who, were, who had different kinds of skill sets. Um, I, I won't go too deep into it, but it is to say that the people that were most successful in a centaur world were not necessarily those that were the most successful in the, the human versus human world. And so with respect to the new information specialties that may be required in medicine, are individuals who may have been expert before no longer going to be expert in a world in which, in which apps are prescriptions? Or I guess what are the skill sets, what are the new skill sets that individuals leading in, in this field, intersecting between uh, clinicians and, and technologists, um, what do you think those are going to be? Maybe, maybe it will still be dominated by the individuals who were still uh, dominant and expert before, uh, but do you think that that could adjust slightly? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, it raises real, it's, and by the way, I just am so glad to see some of my terrific students out tonight. I've just had such a great time this semester at both my health law and health seminar class this year, and. and because of questions like this. And, you know, I, I think that this is, um, what's great is, you know, there's there's the book by Kasparov about the integration of computers into chess. And there's a recent one by a friend of mine named Jonathan Rousen who just wrote a book called The Book of Life, sort of looking at this evolution. 
And I think you're exactly right to say that there could be new skills, right? And it reminds me, actually, I mean, to give a very homely example, I remember when I was on the undergraduate council in college, and I remember my first semester there, there was no email, and the people that led the undergraduate council were generally the best looking and most charismatic people. And then <laughs> by my third year, everything was done on email, and the leaders were the people that would write emails all night. Right, and so, which had very little correlation to your sort of like social skills or attractiveness or what have you. So, this is a really interesting question, you know, in terms of like if in the data question. I think what it really throws to my mind as someone that thinks a lot about political economy and antitrust is that it's quite possible that the entity that will be most effective and the leader will be the entity with the most data, and that's quite remarkable, right? Unless there are some efforts to say come into this and to license access to data to groups that may not have as much access as the leading entities. And so I think what your question really poses to me is something about the political economy and structure of these of the future of healthcare. And I've addressed it a bit in this piece for American Affairs called Tech Platforms and the Knowledge Problem, where I say we either go in the direction of like massive monopolies, where we just sort of say, you know, Amazon could be an example of that, right? You could just sort of say, I want Amazon in charge of everything in healthcare. Right? And my, my friend Nicholas Terry has written a whole article on that, sort of looking at how could Amazon just take over huge amounts of the healthcare sector, right? Or you could say we are going to structure a future where there are going to be lots of different entities that are going to have access to the data and they're going to be able to develop different centaur strategies along the lines of what you're describing in terms of their mixes of, say, uh, physician, domain experts, software, computer science experts, uh, data experts and others. So yeah, it's a really good question, but I, I want to think more about that. Uh, and I, I may put that question to the, the people that wrote that article about the information specialists, because I think that's sort of the next, that should be the next step for what they should work on. So thanks. Other questions? Or? Oh, okay, great. Well, thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much to Dr. Zorman and Costa. Great. <laughs> <laughs>